All right, it's twelve oh four. Let's uh, hopefully people will keep joining, but let's get going. Uh, my name is Scott Peterson. I work with the Northwest Gas Association and uh, am your host today for natural gas utilities, cyber and physical security landscape. Uh, a webinar or briefing really by Amanda Ceramic and John Brick. Um, the uh, two very qualified uh, folks to speak about an issue that is everyone's worst nightmare. Uh, it's super important, so we're happy uh, to have these experts join us and talk about it. Amanda is the senior manager of security at the American Gas Association. Uh, and uh, um, and she's staff executive for the AGA Natural Gas Security Committee and Physical Security Subcommittee, Cybersecurity Subcommittee and Field Operations Committee. So you get a sense for her day-to-day -day is uh, keeping our pipelines uh, and facilities safe. So, and then, um, and then uh, John is retired. Uh, U.S. Air Force Colonel, 30-year uh, career spanning different roles, including uh, <laughs> Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Combat Crew Commander. That's a good, I love that. And military diplomat at U.S. embassies. And he's also been a U.S. intelligence officer instructor and instructor at the Defense Intelligence Agency. So he also brings uh, an impressive array of qualifications and uh, I'm happy to introduce them to you. I'm happy they've joined us. And I'll let uh, Amanda uh, kick us off here. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Amanda, you can put yours up. All right. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, so sorry, Amanda, before <laughs> before you go, uh, we're, we're going to take questions as we go. So put them in the chat. And uh, I'll interrupt. Uh, here now and then to uh, to to ask the question of our speakers, and then we'll also have a Q and A at the end. So um, so I'm going to uh, monitor um, uh, monitor the chat as we go. Okay, sorry, Amanda, go ahead. No worries. Or can you see the the full oh, screen? I'm Amanda. Yeah. Um. Can you see my full screen, or are you seeing the um the PowerPoint with the slides on the left? I'm not sure which screen is sharing. Slides on the left. Okay. So you are. So I'm not sure how to do the full screen. Um. Well, I will just have to work with the slides on the left then. Um. All right. Uh. We went over um. Kind of who we are. Uh, Kimberly Dembo is the Vice President of Security and Operations, so she's my boss. She sends her sincere regrets that she was not able to make it today. She um, she really, really wanted to be there. We, she just got triple booked. So um, so you're stuck with me and John. Um, you would have had John anyway, and he gives a great threat presentation, so excited for that. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit about AGA's Natural Gas Security Program, uh, kind of how we built it, how it's structured, the topics that we cover. John's going to give a threat briefing on um, impacts to threats impacting natural gas. And then I'll give a little bit of uh, the projects that we're working on in physical security and then move on to um, cybersecurity. And here's, you can't see Kimberly. So here's a picture of her in case you guys have not met her. I imagine some of you probably have who've been in the natural gas industry for a while. Uh, a little bit about AGA's natural gas security program. So we have a, a full um, natural gas security committee with two different subcommittees. So there's a cybersecurity subcommittee and a physical security subcommittee. And we have different governance for each one. So we have a chair, a vice chair, and a second vice chair for each of our subcommittees. So six leadership positions within the subcommittee. Uh, and then we have a kind of a sister organization organization or committee that does um, cybersecurity uh, policy. So that's the Cybersecurity Strategy and Regulatory Action Committee, our CISRAC. Um, so those two committees 
really make up our natural gas security department or um, our program. We have about 200 members across the United States, uh, mainly focused on natural gas distribution and the safe and reliable delivery of, um, of the natural gas. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to John to do the threat briefing. John, over to you. All right. How's my level here? Can you hear me all right? We hear you. All right. And Scott, I want to thank you for that great introduction. I like that diverse array of experience. That sounds so much better than can't hold a job. So I'm going to go ahead and use that <laughs> from now on. It's, uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks very much. Yeah. I, uh, I also used to launch the space shuttle, which has nothing to do with this. I just like to tell people. But uh, I've been the DNG threat analyst for about uh, eight years, nine years now. And uh, I am lucky enough to be both the cyber and physical threat intelligence analyst for Downstream Natural Gas. Uh, you may or may not be members of the Downstream Natural Gas ISAC. If you're not, shame on you. If you are eligible, you should be. Um, if you are a member, thank you for participating and also thank you for listening to this briefing. Um, I was given two things to speak about today because it occurs to me that you're probably bombarded by, oh my God, the cyber world is collapsing. Everybody's being intruded on. The government lost their email. All the modems are bad, la la. Well, it's all true. I mean, bad news travels fast. It is true. But since you can read that in the news, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to let you do something you probably don't get to do every day. I'm going to make you all secret agents for just a few minutes. And if you will stick with me and concentrate carefully, I will make you secret agents. I will put you on a secret mission, and then we will find out how that applies to natural gas. So let's say that you are sitting around in your office one day and your secret agent boss comes in and he says, hey, I've got a tasker from the government. Our tourist industry is tanking and we really want to do something. So we've decided that we are going to have the best beaches in the entire world. When people see our beaches, their eyes will water. They will think of us for their vacations. They will come straight here. The only problem is we don't know how to do it. So I'm giving you a very open-ended assignment. You figure out how to do it, but come back to me with information on how to have the best beach in the entire world. And you go, okay, because it means you get to go to a lot of beaches. So you take off out the door. Now you've got some different ways to do that. So the first idea you come up with is, all right, I'm going to build a multi-billion dollar satellite program. It's going to use multi-spectral imaging. It's going to use advanced communications. It's going to be able to maneuver. It's going to be able to send information from satellite to satellite in space, relayed to a ground station for a gigantic team of the world's greatest experts on Photometry and other subjects will be able to interpret all of this intelligence data from these billion dollar satellites. And we will be able to determine the temperature of the sand, the granularity of the sand, the temperature of the water, the depth of the water, what the dunes look like. We will have the best beach in the world by collecting our intelligence in this manner. And then you go, of course, we could try plan B, because plan B is always there. Plan B is, we're all gonna put on black clothes and we're gonna black out our faces and we're gonna get on a submarine. We're gonna cruise up to the coast of the country that currently has the best beaches in the world and we're gonna get out. We're gonna sneak up in a rubber boat. We're all gonna be armed. And we're gonna have a bucket with us. On this beach, we're gonna meet a secret source who we've been paying off. And this guy is going to bring us all the information he has about the beach. After we get that information from him, we're going to scoop up our own bucket of sand. We're going to kill the source so there are no witnesses. We're going to get in the rubber boat, go back out to the submarine and disappear. And when we get back, we'll use all that information we got from our dead source and this bucket of sand we stole. And we're going to have the best beach in the world. Then there's always plan C. Plan C, well, the other one seemed a little harsh. Let's uh, try something different. How about I'll get everybody in our country to go on vacation? That's right. We're just going to tell people, hey, whenever you go to country with the best beach in the world, here's what I want you to do. Just do whatever you do. Go visit friends, go out and eat, take pictures of everything, uh, 
look at newspapers, go to the beach, lay out on the beach, get some sun, talk to the lifeguards, just hang out, have a good time on the beach. Don't worry about anything. And you start to think to yourself, well, how does that work? So, well, what happens is my plan, when all these people come back from the beach, they're going to be hundreds of thousands of them that go there every year. And every one of them is going to have a little bit of different information. They're all going to have different pictures. They're all going to have different stories. They'll all have met different people. And we'll be able to talk to them about that, to debrief them on that and to get that information. And we can take their towels and we will shake millions and millions of grains of sand out of those towels. And we will be able to collect without killing anybody, without having to do anything illegal. We just do what we do. And eventually we will have all the information to make the greatest beach in the world. So there are three choices, multi-billion dollar satellite and scientific program, covert action, murder, and sneaking up in the middle of the night, we're going on vacation and just talking to people. How does this apply to Gannis? Because I'm talking about the actual world and how intelligence collection works and what you are being subjected to right now. In the case of the multi-billion dollar satellite system, that's how the United States does business. When we want to find out information about another country, we use technology because we have the best technology for a little while by a small margin. And we're out there and we're doing this kind of thing. The guys with the rubber boat in the middle of the night, popping the source and stealing the sand, that's Russia. That's what they do. They're going to get inside. They're going to get an insider threat. They're going to get somebody to deliver the information they need. Then they're going to cover their tracks and they're going to make off with the stuff they've got. Option C, number three, who's that? That's China. China literally has a global intelligence collection program called Million Grains of Sand. And in this collection program, they don't do anything special. All they do is send their people out, and when they go on vacation, or when they visit a company, or when they go to a trade show, or when they go to a higher learning institute, they are often funded, they are often monitored, and they are always, upon their return, debriefed for their information. So every time you encounter somebody like this out in your comings and goings at your professional events, your trade shows, what you're saying, the photographs, everything is being collected. And that information is going back to the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist government. And they are using that to prepare the battle space. And the battle space is being prepared so that they can eventually seize Taiwan, so they can eventually establish dominance in the world no longer have a multipolar uh, authority throughout the globe. They want to be the one big dog on the street. This is what you're up against. So be aware when you post professional documents, when you get a query from somebody uh, from a Chinese research agency wanting to collaborate on a paper, et cetera, et cetera, even when you have official visitors at your business, that's what you're up against. Okay. Second thing I wanted to talk to you about is cyber safety from remote work locations. A lot of people don't go in the office anymore. We've got our home situation. I've got mine set up right now. I'm talking to you on my home computer. And you've got a network in your house. You read on the news and you see that all these government networks are being intruded upon. And you may have seen where home networks are being intruded upon also. For example, modems. I won't name any brands, but there have been a slew of modems that have been absolutely infested with bad actors who are out there and getting into your home network. And by getting into your home network, they can sit in a place where they can monitor the work you do from home. So if you are attaching your work device to your home network, there may be somebody sitting on the line and listening. Now, this is fairly well known. I'll go back and cite a case back in 2016 where a casino, which has a lot of money going through it, was infested with ransomware. Now, they had all of the endpoint protection you can imagine. They had all the antivirus. They had all the firewalls. They had everything else. Their financial network was nailed down tight, but it was part of their greater casino network that ran through the hotel. 
One day, somebody came in and in the great big 3,000 gallon aquarium in the front of the casino, they put in a new thermostat because they wanted to keep the fish happy. And the thermostat was Wi-Fi connected. And as soon as that thermostat was connected to the Wi-Fi, it had a vulnerability and the ransomware folks were probing, found this device that was vulnerable, got into the ran or got into the casino network through a thermostat in the fish tank and installed ransomware. And they had to pay a bounty to get out of that. So, wow. So, you know, you're being careful with your modem. You know, these things can happen. Here's something you might not have thought of. What else is on your network at home that might be watching you while you're watching it? I brought this up at the uh, AGA Spring Security Conference in Charleston a few weeks ago. I talked about your television set, your home TV. You know, what was the, the joke used to be uh, in, uh, in the United States, you watch TV in Russia, TV watch you. Uh, it's, it's not really so much of a joke anymore because about a week after I made that presentation, LG television came out and said their web operating system had a giant vulnerability that allowed people not only to observe actually through the cameras, uh, but they could also observe all your network traffic. So if you are at home and you are browsing the web on your TV, or if you connect your laptop to your home network, here is this television set in the corner that nobody's thinking about, may not even be turned on, but the Wi-Fi is active. And that allows these intruders to monitor your network traffic or to actually get in and affect your network. I often say you're not safe anywhere when you start talking about cybersecurity and that pretty much sums it up. So I've talked to you a little bit about secret agent for a day, how different organizations collect intelligence and specifically the threat from China, their million grains of sand program. I've also talked about your TV might be watching you uh, be aware of what you have in your home network if you work, work remotely and if you connect your devices to it. And that is my scary tale for right now. I will take a break and see if there are any questions. And if not, I'll pass it over to Amanda. Thank you. Yeah, any questions at this point? Um, type them into the chat. Uh, I don't see any right now, so... They're all stunned. Or they're running out to unplug their televisions. <laughs> I'm unplugging my whole Wi-Fi system. Yeah, if, if you plug it in, it's a mistake. Anything that plugs in is a is a, an attack from it, so you got to be careful. Um. Okay. Well, Amanda, why don't you take it from there? And as if we get questions in the chat, I'll interrupt you. Great. I can't believe we don't have any questions. That was great, John. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for scaring us, I guess, right? Who needs a horror film? film? Um, all right. So next, I will go to uh, try to take you back to the less scary side um, of, uh, of AGA's security committee and what we do to try to prevent some of those. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a um, physical security and a cyber security subcommittee. And I'll go over some of the workshops and some of the events that each of these committees do, some of the um, projects that, that our committees work on. Uh, the first one uh, I was going to talk about a little bit was our protecting your most valuable asset, your employees. Uh, we had this workshop. We were working on this project for about, I'm going to say it's almost a year. Um, we held the workshop hosted by SoCal Gas and Sempra Energy in January. And it was a a great workshop. It was two full days. We had uh, folks from the uh, police officers from the LA County Sheriff's Office come in and they did a, a few hours they spent with us talking about bomb uh, bomb threats, um, hazardous material threats, active assailant threats, and how to protect yourselves against those. And unfortunately, in LA County, you can imagine that uh, those folks who are presenting had to deal with those very threats um, on a on a 
somewhat regular basis. So within the the past month or so of them presenting, they all had real real experience in in having to deal with that. Um, so they came and presented on that. Uh, we also had a half day de escalation training where we had a consultant come in and there was some um, kind of role playing that we did and uh, everyone received a certificate for a de-escalation training certificate. And we're seeing that more and more in our membership um, with our with our companies, how important that is becoming to train your field workers on de-escalation training. Um, AGA is actually looking to do something like this annually or at least do it again next year because it was, it was very, very well received. Um, and one of the last things I wanted to highlight for, for that workshop that we did was um, PG&E had or is in the process of rolling out a pilot program for virtual reality training. And they have developed three vignettes on uh, situational awareness and active shooter, active assailant, and how to um, kind of how to mitigate your threat when you're in those situations. So we all had uh, the chance to go through on a rotating basis. We, they brought in, pg e brought in 50 VR headsets, and we all got to go through and do all three of these scenarios. And it was it was really, really interesting. We got a lot of really good feedback on that. And later on in the presentation, I've got some couple pictures you can see of folks with the headsets on. Um, one of the other programs we have is our, on the physical security side is our focus group. Um, we have one on the cyber side as well. And our focus group has been revamped this year to really reflect uh, some of the the more 2024 type issues that we're seeing, um, maybe election scenario issues, protests, um, drones. What are you? How are you dealing with drones? Um, travel policy. Do you guys have travel policies based on um, using uh, rideshare like Lyft or Uber? And we it, we have a very small group. So there's six companies that are invited into each of these focus groups. So it's a very open forum. Everyone signs NDAs and we kind of talk about, hey, where, you know, wh where are you seeing challenges and how are you overcoming them? So um, that's been, we're, we're about halfway through, two thirds of the way through the first um, iteration this year of our physical security focus group. Uh, the next project that we're working on is Fusion Center Outreach. So our many of our field operators and our security personnel have been seeing a lot of um, sabotage, tampering, um, some sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional, uh, but but people messing with their facilities out um, their their critical infrastructure. And a lot of times the um, law enforcement officials will come and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll give them a slap on the wrist, but there hasn't been much enforcement or many arrests or, or really much repercussions at all for this vandalism or um, trespassing. And so we've been going region by region, um, sometimes state by state, to try to educate the local uh, law enforcement via fusion centers, um, fusion centers and the FBI National Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, so working with both of those entities to try to get our operators on on the phone or in the room and um, show them where the critical infrastructure is. Um, sometimes it's hidden in plain sight, right? If you're in the Midwest, they might have a compression station that's kind of um, disguised as a barn, so it doesn't really stand out. And so we, we went through and we went, we had operators kind of show the locations of their facilities and what the public safety risk or impact could be if someone had um, intentionally or intentionally or unintentionally damaged some of this critical infrastructure. So we've done about uh, three or four uh, regions so far. Um, and uh, I have another slide that kind of shows our schedule for that. And then the last physical security topic that I will talk about is our, this is physical and cybersecurity. We have our natural gas exercise that some of you may have participated in in 2022. This is a semi or biannual every other year um, exercise that we do kind of um, on the off years of GridX. If some of you are electric companies, you're, you're very familiar with the GridX exercise. Um, and GX is the natural gas version of that. It's much, much smaller. We are in the process of designing our second iteration of that right now. And that will be held in Tulsa, Oklahoma, September 19th. That coincides with our um, security conference that One Gas is hosting. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be the security conference and Thursday will be NGX. We will have four different breakout sessions. We'll have a cybersecurity breakout, 
physical security breakout, business continuity, and gas control. And so we have, we're building scenarios right now to test kind of the, um, the resiliency and the processes that you have in place for each one of those um, those departments within your company. So we will also have a hybrid version uh, in 2022 when we did it, we were kind of still coming out of COVID. So we did it 100% virtually. And this year we're doing it in person with um, with a hybrid option if we wanted to, if folks wanted to participate virtually. Of course, you're welcome to come to Tulsa as well. Uh, I think you'll probably get more um, more out of it in person, but uh, we had folks last time who who kind of did their own hybrid, where they had company their entire um, participants from their company came in the conference room and they all kind of held held their own uh, breakout session. So uh, that worked really well for some folks. Um, all right, I'll show you some of our examples of the um, the project. So this is the protecting your most valuable, uh, I said MVPs, that was, um, the title is too long. It's your most valuable assets, uh, your employees. And so your personnel are your most valuable assets. And so here you can kind of see the audience um, and this, uh, the speaker up there, I believe was from the um, LA County Sheriff's Department. They were talking about the book, now movie, how to blow up a pipeline and um, some of the attention that's been getting. And then the other picture here is uh, when we went into our breakout rooms, the, um, the VR goggles and folks going through those different scenarios. Here's just a couple of the questions and, and the type of questions. I don't expect you to be able to read all of them, but um, this is the focus group that we have for our physical security subcommittee. And we just kind of ask questions about, um, you know, do you have a work from abroad policy? Some companies have uh, offices that are outside of the United States and, and some companies don't, but they allow you to work from certain state, certain countries, but not other countries. So we kind of talked about that. Um, we talked about uh, drone policy and artificial intelligence. So it's a two-hour session where we just kind of have a very um, facilitated open roundtable. And then the last thing, I think this is the last physical security thing I have, is um, the fusion center engagement that I had talked about um, and the, the schedule. Basically, um, so far we've done Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And then we did uh, kind of a Midwest larger group was, it was a little bit, um, a little bit big, but uh, we did North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Arkansas. And then we just uh, last week completed New York and we're looking to do um, a session with the Texas Fusion Center sometime this summer. Okay, on to our cybersecurity subcommittee. We also have a cyber focus group, and I'll show you some of those type of questions. Um, then we have a cyber metrics program. This is something that we started a few years ago. This is also a semi-annual event where we do it every other year. So we're going to do it this year. It started out as 10 short questions, became about 15 short questions. Now it's about 20 questions. Um, those are based on the TSA security directives. If any of you are impacted by those, you probably, your security professionals have been living with those for the last two, three years now. Um, it's gotten legal folks involved, compliance folks involved. Um, it's It's been a very, very heavy lift, but it, it really has helped secure our industry over the past few years. We're in the process of working with TSA to, um, to try to help um, shape the legislation that's coming out. We expect the notice of proposed rulemaking for that to come out sometime uh, in the summer, we're hoping. Uh, it was supposed to be October, then it keeps getting pushed back. But um, anyway, the cyber metrics program is based on the security directive questions. And so it gets folks um, kind of thinking about their maturity level. So this is based on the, the NISC cybersecurity framework. And it gives you um, options to to kind of grade how mature you are on a one through five scale and so we take all the responses we get this is a this is an AGA board priority meaning that the board has has try to get us to benchmark for the industry some cyber standards and and see where other folks are in their maturity level. And so we take the responses, we anonymize them and analyze them, and then we produce an infographic that I'll show you in a minute just on where they're where we're doing really, really strong as an industry and then some areas 
for improvement. And those areas of improvement then turn into projects over the next two years, since this program is um, a two year, we do it every other year. And so I think last year was, um, we found out, hey, we really should be talking to some of our operators about how to separate their IT environment from their operational technology, their OT environment, and how, what are some, some best practices for doing that. So we created um, an infographic for that. And we had a workshop on that. We, we talk about it our security conference and just try to get folks thinking a different way. Um, and then uh, we talked about the infographic a little bit. That was one of the projects that um, came out of our, uh, our, our submetrics program. And then the natural gas exercise that I already talked about. As far as the cyber focus groups, we asked some questions um, such as the in identifying the inter interdependencies between your IT environment and your OT environment. So for example, if you're something on your IT environment, like your nomination system or something goes down, is that going to impact the flow of gas? Um, and so trying to really identify there's, it's a little bit obvious on the OT environment, things that impact the flow of natural gas, but on the IT environment, it's a little bit harder because it might be secondary or tertiary. So I'm um, just kind of talking through that and what, what things you should consider when, um, when you're trying to evaluate what really would impact the flow of gas. Um, another question we had was about authenticating folks to get into critical cyber systems, that's the CCS, and, and discussing what controls you have in place. So those are just some examples of, of the questions we have for our cyber focus group. The next slide is our, um, this is the metric or the dashboard that we kind of developed from the 2022 cyber metric summary. Um, so we have, uh, as you can see, we did this the first time in 2020, and then 2022 was the second year we did it. And on the right-hand side, I'll kind of talk about uh, most of that. So we have the optimizing means we're doing really, really good in this. That's a level five. Um, and then the uh, quantitatively managed and, and these words come from NIST. They wouldn't be words that I would use, but um, these are the, the NIST framework um, terminology. And so those are the scale four and a five, optimizing being the five and the quantitatively managed being a four. Um, and it kind of shows these are the areas we're doing really, really well or where, where we've had the most areas of improvement. So under optimizing in 2020, we had um, OT not separated or not reliant on IT. We had 16%, which isn't a, a very high number. But then two years later, we had 34%. So that was over double increase. Um, so that was pretty impressive pr progress that we've made. Um, so that's just kind of an example of showing the the kind of metrics and the analysis that's done after we develop these um, these questions and get the the answers done. The next slide is just an example of the infographic that I was talking about, and this was um, it's called important operations. So how do you identify um, some op some technology, whether it's IT or OT, that that impacts the flow of gas. And so it's just some thought process to go through. Obviously the, you know, turning the valves and stuff like that, the operational technology that definitely impacts the flow of gas. But what about other systems such as your, you know, your billing system or your nomination system or other business systems? How does that impact the flow of gas? So this is just something to kind of get your thoughts going on, um, you know, secondary tertiary ways to, um, to protect your system. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the cyber regulations. I talked about um, the big one, which was the TSA security directives. Um, those have been, that was all a result of the 2021 Colonial Pipeline incident, the ransomware incident that kind of crippled the East Coast for a few days. Uh, and that was basically caused because the IT and OT, um, the interdependencies that were going on there and the inability to determine what would impact the flow of gas. So that's why we're really focusing on that. Um, in addition to the TSA security directives, there is um, this uh, DHS CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, has a Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, CIRCIA, CISA, CIRCIA. Um, CIRCIA is right, right now it's out for comment. 
this is a monster. It's about 447 pages and our members are trying to digest it and um, and we're making comments. There was an RFI, I don't know, six or eight months ago or maybe even longer. We provided comments um, and so CISA came back and with this new updated CIRCIA proposed rule. And so we're, we're in the process of reading that and providing comments to that. Um, and then there's also less AGA members, but some of uh, some members are impacted by the Coast Guard Maritime Transportation Security Act. That's mainly for LNG facilities. Um, and I wanted to note those are all DHS regulations that we're working on right now. And our AGA and many of our other sister brother trade associations are working on with the government to try to emphasize the importance of harmonization hey guys, talk to each other, right? You guys are all DHS components and you're asking for different things. So some of the TSA security directives are conflicting with some of the uh, regulations and the, the rules that are in CERCIA, which might conflict with the TSA or the Coast Guard um, T MTSA. So um, those are just some of the things that we're working on. There's a couple other regulations that are already in place, the Security and Exchange Commission, and then the DOD Cyber Maturity Model Certification uh, that's basically for companies or utilities that feed uh, military bases. Um, and I saw Scott come on. Did you have some questions, Scott? You're on mute. I can't hear. You're still, it looks like you're still on mute. Oh, sorry. Um, there you go. Uh, are you are you basically done with your presentation, Amanda? Yes. Okay. Because uh, this this is a this is kind of a big question. Uh, can you share what learnings were gained from the Colonial Pipeline incident and industry recommendations made as a result? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it sure is a big one. Um, at the high level, I think. All in all, it was um, very unfortunate, but I think because of the Colonial Pipeline incident, we've become a much more secure industry as a whole. Um, and case in point is some of these other regulations that are coming out, such as CERCIA and the Coast Guard MTSA Act, they're asking us to do simple things that we really should be doing all along. And, and a couple of those are separating your IT from your OT. You really need to do that. If you cannot separate your IT from your OT and you can't in, operate independently for, you know, X number of days, and you need to determine your own risk profile in how many days. It, what is my risk profile? What what is my, um, you know, how, how long can I operate manually? So kind of running through through those scenarios and determining how long um, how long can you? Uh, what are your um, what mitigations do you have in place in case you don't have certain um, certain tools like your communication? Do you have your all of your playbooks online? You shouldn't have all your playbooks online. I mean, they should be online, but in addition, they should be stored somewhere a, as a hard copy, right? Like, what do you do? Who do you call? Um, all of your your contacts, your your points of contact, they need to be updated and tested on a regular basis. Um, we had an exercise, actually NGX two years ago, we had someone who was going through their Rolodex, not Rolodex, but their um, corporate directory when they had to call someone. I think we had a fleet management issue two years ago in our scenario. And so they were calling their fleet manager saying, hey, what would you do? Only to find out that the phone number wasn't wasn't good. The, the guy had left. <laughs> and so he was like, oh, we need to update our um, our corporate directory more often, right? Um, so that's you know just one example. Um, another example is changing your passwords. Uh, a lot of folks, we were so surprised to hear that a lot of companies, you just not natural gas companies, but just companies in general, they buy this equipment and they keep the default password. Don't do that. Change your password. <laughs> the default passwords are very easily accessible. So if you buy a piece of equipment, it has a password. It usually comes with a default password. Change it immediately and change it often. So that's another lessons learned that came out of Colonial. Um, Multi-factor authentication. That's another um, a big item that we're we're working on, um, trying to just help any company that might not have uh, optimized that practice yet. It's a really important one to do. Hopefully that answers your question.
Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that that was the question was from Dan Kirshner, who's in Denmark right now, uh, studying uh, their decarbonization program using natural gas um, with a group of legislators. So, Dan, if you're listening, do you have a follow up on that? Uh, and then uh, one question I had is there. So you have all these programs going on, which is awesome, actually. Is there like a one stop shop for because it's mostly utility folks online with us to to uh, work with the AGA um, and, and plug into these different things that you're doing? Sure. If you are an AGA member, all of this is open to you. So you can contact me. Um, and I don't know if I, I can send you or I can put my email address in the chat and you can contact me and we can get you connected to our security committee. Of course, you have to be an AGA member, but um, if you are, then we would be happy to bring you on to some of these projects. Okay, awesome. And then um, I was wondering, you know, following the blow up the pipeline book and movie, uh, have we seen any like copycats or yet or anyone who's grabbed on to ideas in that book? Fortunately, yeah, fortunately we have not seen any activity um, that we can directly correlate to or, or kind of um, say it was because of a, a result of reading or seeing, reading the book or seeing the movie. Um, there has been a couple universities that have, um, added that book to their curriculum and as an industry many of the trade associations have kind of put out a shame on you letter like why are you advocating the destruction of critical infrastructure and, and possibly harming people that's not um, doesn't seem like it's a very um, appropriate and um, intelligent thing to do but uh, we haven't seen any any real impacts from the book fortunately and John, if you if you have, feel free to chime in. No, nope, that's pretty much it. I was a bit horrified to see that these universities were throwing that into their curriculum. Um, times have changed since I went to school, I guess. But uh, fortunately, we are we are ahead of that. I think that we've identified it as something bad, and we brought that up. And people, when they review what they've been signing off on at these universities have put it on hold. So I don't know anybody that's going through on that right now, but it would have been pushed through had it not been for people in the industry and the pipeline side looking at that and going, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that whole thing is crazy. Um, Amanda put her email in the chat. So anyone who wants to dig deeper into uh, AGA services around safety and security, um, connect with her. Uh, and then let me think. So you mentioned uh, passwords, uh, multi, uh, is it multi? Multi-factor authentication. There you go, factor. Yeah, MFA. MFA, uh, having a CIO, um, is there between the two of you can are there two or three more like gotta do this suggestions off the top of your head simple ways to take the next step well if you're a dng isac partner you can jump on there and look at probably eight years worth of information uh, that tells you exactly that but the short answer is uh, go look at the CISA page. If you're not a DNGI site partner, or if you are, CISA has basic cyber hygiene. It's been uh, collaborated on by CISA, by the uh, NSA, by the Department of Defense. These are the things that you can do that are the most basic things. This is, this is like, remember to shut your door when you leave for vacation, okay? It is the most basic thing you can do. But if you don't do it, you are opening yourself up for a world of trouble. It includes the things uh, Amanda mentioned about getting rid of these uh, hard-coded passwords about the default passwords, multi-factor authentication, logging. If you have the ability to log, you should be doing it. If you don't have the ability, you should go out and get the ability because that's going to show you where you started. And if something changes, that's another way to look at uh, somebody might be into your system. 
Maybe it's not necessarily going to be a, a bad thing happening, but it's going to be a different thing happening. We heard people talking about living off the land. That's where somebody doesn't come in with like their magic keyboard and their hoodie and start typing magic numbers and they get into your system through, you know, brute force or genius. That means that they just find that you didn't change that password or they go ask somebody in your company for that password, or they catch it in an email because somebody didn't protect it appropriately. And then they log in as that person and now they belong there. I mean, you can't spot that person because it's, you know, Scott Peterson logged into the network and well, okay, good old Scott, he's working today, but it's not Scott. You know, you find out it's yeah. coming from Bangladesh and it's three o'clock in the morning, that's probably not you. So yeah. that log gives you that opportunity to look at that and say, okay, everything looks good except ooh, what's this? You know, and then it's going to be that one clue that really lights this up for you and lets you get in there and get ahead of this uh, intruder. Amanda, what do you think? I agree. Um, and I just put in the chat the um, the reference that John had re referenced from the uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. They have a ton of references on their website, and um, there's a a, a, um, a whole bunch of different content, best practices on um, holiday shopping or just general cybersecurity best practices, insider threat best practices. So um, I put the link in the chat. So if anyone is interested in, in learning more, then there's a lot of, lot of reading and a lot, um, lot of resources available on their website. So for those who join us online, uh, put your questions in the chat if you have any more. Uh, if you have a comment you want to make, uh, raise your hand and we can recognize you if you want to, there's something you have to say. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, I don't have anything else unless 